Hello, this is Professor James Strickler, and this is a course in American government. This lesson is from Unit 8. It's the final lesson of Unit 8. It's Lesson 14 about the difference between can or should. In this lesson, you'll learn about the difference between can or should. You'll learn about the idea of we, the Supreme Court. And you'll learn about the consequences that these ideas have for constitutionalism. Let's begin with a, what may seem like simple question, but as it turns out, maybe it isn't. What is the difference between can and should? Can is a question of capacity or permission. Do you have the ability to do a thing is what we're wondering if we ask you if you can do it. Should is a question about morality or wisdom. If we ask whether you should do something, we're asking whether it's a good idea to do it, not whether you're capable of doing it. Now we understand the difference between those things, let's ask what part of government decides what the government should do. That's the responsibility for the legislature. The legislature is about this question of should. Basically what they're asking themselves when they try to pass a law is, is this law a good idea? They're not asking themselves whether they have the power to enact the law. They're simply asking themselves whether they think it would be a positive thing to enact the law. So then what part of government decides what government can do? That's something for the court to decide. Basically what the court says is, is this law allowed by the Constitution? No, that's how that's deciding whether a thing can happen or not. But even though those are the, what we consider the standard roles for those branches of government, it sure seems like the Supreme Court doesn't actually decide its cases based on what the Constitution really allows. Instead, it sure seems like they decide their cases based on what they feel should be allowed. So they would get a case about same, same, say, same, say, same, uh, same sex marriage. The justices look in their own hearts and say, do I think that homosexual couples should be able to marry? Yes, I do. Therefore, I will end up finding some way to say that's in the Constitution or whatever the case may be. When they're making their decisions based on what's in their heart, they're based in, doing them based on what they think should happen rather than what the Constitution says can happen. The reason this is an important distinction, an important issue, we can realize if we go back to a concept that you learned earlier in this unit. Please recall that we talked about how rights and powers are sort of two sides of the same coin. And once we've decided they're two sides of the same coin, then the next thing is to figure out where that coin is kept. If individuals keep the coin, we'll call the thing a right. If one or the other uh, levels of government keeps it, either the state or the national government, we're going to call it a power. Well, when we start creating or destroying or redefining rights, we are basically moving the coins around from one bank to another. So, for example, before the case Roe v. Wade is decided, state governments control whether or not a woman is allowed to get an abortion. Then, arguably, with the Roe v. Wade decision, that power is moved to the individuals. Now a woman gets to decide. But arguably, it's also been moved to the national government, because who's deciding whether the woman can do that? It's the United States Supreme Court, which is part of the national government. Now, regardless of where the coin is moved, recognize that it's been moved by somebody. And the question is, did the right person move it? And if not, what's the problem with it being moved by who did move it? To answer those questions, we need to remind ourselves of a concept learned much earlier in this course, the idea of constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is the notion that the powers of government can be defined and limited. In other words, governments aren't free to just do anything they want. They can have constraints put upon them. Now, please recall from when we learned about constitutionalism, 
Who is it in our system of government that defines and limits the powers of government? Who is it that tells the government what they can and can't do in our system? The who is seen in the opening words of the Constitution of the United States of America. It is we the people that limit and define our government. And so that idea that we are the ones that put boundaries on our government through the Constitution that we create then leads to the next idea. What we call popular sovereignty. That it's we the people that are in charge that decide what our government can and can't do. And we decide that through the Constitution. So then, if coins are going to get moved around between the piggy banks, and we the people are the sovereign, who are in charge, who are deciding what our governments can and can't do, really we should be the ones moving the coins around. And how would we do that according to the Constitution? We would do that by passing amendments that change the rules of where the coins are supposed to be. But what we've seen in this unit, and in other things we've discussed in this course, is that in modern America, it's the courts that are moving the coins around. So arguably, rather than it being we the people that are deciding where the powers of government are, instead it's we the court that's acting like the sovereign, who's deciding where uh, the power should lodge, whether a particular power is an individual power, state power, national power. It's the court deciding all these things. And when you think about it, really, if the court's the one deciding where the, all the coins are, in a sense, they control all the coins. All the coins are sitting in the national piggy bank because it's the Supreme Court that decides where the coins will be. And that then gives us a very, very fundamental problem. This is something we've talked about before in the course. If the courts, as part of the national government, can redefine the boundaries of that government, in effect, there is no constitution. Now, this is a very important thing to remember, and here's why. As we went through this unit about civil liberties, and we came to all these various cases where the Supreme Court was creating or defining constitutional rights, in every case, you possibly said, yeah, I agree with that. I'm glad that the Supreme Court said in Gideon versus Wainwright that the government has to pay for your attorney. I'm glad in Roe v. Wade that they said that a woman has a right to abortion, or whatever the, the case may be. You may go through all these cases and say, you know what, I like what the Supreme Court did every single time. But even if that's your point of view, this should still be problematic. Because while today you may be happy with the results you're getting from this very, very powerful court that can define, create, and even destroy your rights anytime you want, Tomorrow you could end up with a different group of people on that court who see the rights differently than you. And once you've given them the power to create and define those rights, they then have the power to destroy them also. Effectively, you're living under a uh, aristocracy or oligarchy, to use terms from much earlier in this course. You're living under a small group of people, what Learned Hand called uh, platonic guardians, who are deciding for you what your rights and powers should be. Now, if they happen to be good people in those positions at a given time, you may be happy with the decisions they make about your rights. But once you've turned that power over, you're going to have to accept the possibility that you could end up with bad people in that position that you don't agree with anymore. And it's almost impossible to get the power back once you've given it to them, short of rebellion and revolution. So, the Supreme Court having all this power, even if you happen to like what they're doing it right now, should remain a scary and troubling thing for you. Because ideally, it shouldn't be the Supreme Court telling all the rest of us what we can and can't do. We should be telling the court what it can and can't do, if we the people really are sovereign. Now, let's review what we learned in this lesson. What part of the government decides what the government can do? Is it Congress, the Supreme Court, the presidency, or the bureaucracy? It's the Supreme Court that decides what the government can do through its power of judicial review where they declare things unconstitutional. But what part of the government decides what the government should do? 
Is that Congress, the Supreme Court, the presidency, or the bureaucracy? To tell you the truth, that was a trick question. Because ideally speaking, it should be Congress that decides what the government should do. And then the court sits in the background and lets the Congress know, oh, okay, yeah, you thought that was a good idea, but I'm sorry that that power wasn't granted you in the Constitution. You're not allowed to that do that. But what we've seen is the Supreme Court actually, rather than making those decisions based on can, they're making them upon their own judgment of what the government should be doing. So the Supreme Court has effectively usurped this power to decide what the government should be. And despite some of the justices saying just the opposite, they in effect have set themselves up as a super legislature. For example, one of the most recent ones, telling 40 of the states that they have to allow same-sex marriage whether they want to or not. What is the danger of courts defining rights? Is it that the people are no longer sovereign possibly, instead the court is? Is it that the Constitution becomes meaningless because it's supposed to be boundaries on power and now the government is setting its own boundaries? Is it neither of those things or is it both of those things? Actually, both of those are dangers created by the Supreme Court having so much power to define, to create, and even destroy rights. That completes this lesson and that completes this unit. The next lesson will be from Unit 9, Lesson 1, about civil rights and the Civil War.